Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Jeans. What we are going to be doing today is go planet hunting with the best. Someone who NASA calls the Indiana Jones of exoplanets. A special guest today is a professor of planetary science, physics, aeronautics and astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is the deputy director for the MIT led NASA mission TESS and is also actively involved in the JPL MIT CubeSat Asteria. She is the lead for the Starshade mission and has been awarded her PhD from Harvard University, also spending research time at the Carnegie Institute of Washington and Princeton. She has just released a new book called The Smallest Lights in the Universe, a memoir. And anyone who is interested in exoplanets, I highly recommend that you get this book. I've read it myself and it's absolutely stunning. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a 2013 fellow MacArthur. Wow. And that I think is all we can say about this profile. And Indian Genes now very proudly presents the ultimate exoplanet explorer and an extremely inspiring individual, Professor Sarah Seger. Hello, Sarah, and a very big welcome to you from all of us at Indian Genes and everyone listening in here. A big thank you for taking time out from your very busy schedule to speak to us. And we've been really waiting to do this. Hi everyone, I am Professor Sarah Seeger from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. At MIT, I work on a lot of different things, mostly focused around exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than the sun. And my work ranges from sophisticated computer models to interpret data on exoplanet atmospheres and make predictions for the future, as well as on space missions to find and characterize new exoplanets. So yes, Sarah, we all are very interested in the TESS mission and we have been following it. I think it was launched in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, atop a, a Falcon 9 rocket. Please tell us more about that. Yes, TESS is really the main exoplanet mission today, in existence today. It's an MIT-led NASA mission and TESS launched in April 2018. We, we launched from Cape Canaveral on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. It's amazing. I hope, I hope all of you someday get to witness a launch in person. It's just incredibly exciting, especially if you've worked on that mission. Everything you've worked on is like all in this fairing of the rocket and the rocket is so powerful and it's carrying your special mission up to outer space. And so it's all uh, really, really exciting. Well, TESS has been orbiting Earth now for two and a half years, and it's actually completed its prime mission. TESS consists of four cameras, essentially like a glorified telephoto lens, and each camera is only about 10 centimeters in diameter. And these cameras are very special, though. It's not the type of camera you would have, you know, if you dug through your old stuff or your parents' old stuff. It's not the type of camera you would have at home. It's very special to be made so it doesn't um, change with temperature much and that it doesn't have too much distortion at the edges and it's a very, very wide field. TESS observes giant a giant strip of the sky, like literally 90 by 24 degrees. If I can, ex um, if you have seen the constellation Orion in the night right. sky, each Orion would fit in each TESS camera. So it's like four Orions stacked on top of each other and TESS observes one of those fields for one month each. And every month, there's something like between a few hundred thousand to a million stars that our computers search through. And eventually, the goal is to find planets transiting other stars. And every month, by the way, we found about we find about 100 planet candidates. That's stunning. And is it true that TESS would actually cover up to 400 times the area compared to uh, what the Kepler telescope is doing? Yeah, Ke yes, that's correct, actually. TESS is what well, is just an all-sky survey, and its goal is to survey most of the sky. Also, just FYI, the TESS data is all public as soon as it can be. It takes a couple months for the, the data gets downlinked, 
once a month and then we have to process the data, we being NASA and MIT to make it usable. But anyone can, well, you need, you can't just, and not anyone, but if you were diligent and wanted to learn, you could actually download the test data and play around with it. We definitely will get back to tests as we would want to know more from you about it. And I just want to put a thought across here as a science enthusiast. There's one thing that I have noticed uh, over these years that recently there has been a shift in interest, if you may call it that. And uh, exoplanets, so the search for exoplanets seems to be uh, at the forefront now. And I'm not sure if it was as popular as it was uh, at that time when you were starting off in your career. And I would assume that it would not have been a popular or a safe field to get into, but maybe because there was a lot of speculation at that time? Yes, that's totally right. Today, it's actually, I mean, science is hard no matter how you slice it. But today, finding planets, it's just, we have this phrase here, standard operating procedure. It's really like the algorithms are all well-developed. There are many codes, computer codes, like in Python that are publicly available. And so it's very, the entry level is more straightforward because the tools are all there for you. And there's lots and lots of people working in the field right now. There's a, there was a conference last week where online, a confer, an online meeting, and there were 900 people had registered to attend the conference and it was just specialized on exoplanets. And that conference uh, capped the attendance. So there'd be more people, thousand, more than a thousand would have attended. Back in the day when I started working on exoplanets, conferences were very rare and something like 30 people would attend, three zero, 30 people, not a thousand people, but 30. And at the time when I started working on exoplanets, they were brand new, such that we knew of four or five exoplanets, whereas today we know of thousands of them. And when I started as well, you know, people didn't believe the exoplanets were real. Right. And I think the first exoplanet discovered was uh, somewhere in 1995, where a Jupiter-sized planet was found, and then all of a sudden, the discoveries just started pouring in. It was. And what actually happened was the team that found the first, announced the first exoplanet around a sun-like star, it's called 51 Peg B, they sat on their discovery for over a year because they didn't, it was so strange. You know, we were thinking about Jupiter at Jupiter's distance. Jupiter takes 12 years to orbit our sun, but the new hot Jupiter, as we called it, only took a few days to orbit its sun-like star. So that's just crazy. And all we know about stars and star formation, it doesn't look like there's enough material that close to the star, so close to the star that you could form a, a massive Jupiter. So the whole thing was quite puzzling. So after 51 Peg B was announced, a competing team, you know what? They had planets in their data already, but they hadn't been looking for planets with very short periods. So the, the planets were already there. And sure enough, as you said, once they started looking at their data, they found planets and were able to announce them pretty quickly. Can you imagine going into a field of science, diligently collecting data, and missing, missing some big discoveries because you just weren't looking? Or if you had Python in those days, uh, you could have picked it up. You could have done it. And it, you, they did search with computer codes. But remember, the code only does what you tell it to. So if you had Python back then, would you have told it to look for something so out, far outside the bounds of what you and everybody else considered reasonable? In fact, even the Kepler mission, they apparently had cut off their search for planets at one day period. So they were only looking for planets that orbited their star with the one day. That's extreme even. Imagine if our year, our Earth year, our time to go around our sun was only one day. That's crazy. And you know, by Kepler's third law, planets that are that move quickly around their star are very close to the star as well. So later, another group looked at the Kepler data, and they didn't limit it to one day period. And lo and behold, they found planets that orbit their star with less than a day period, like 0.8 days or something. So we all have that. It's for all of us, you know, the, especially those learning how to program. It's pretty interesting because the computer will literally, you, you know, you discover for the first time that your program, the, the computer just does what you tell it to. Right. And, and like you said, Python can be a double-edged sword for students getting into the field. 
uh, and they need to be aware that Python can be provided coordinates to find stuff. Uh, it's ready-made, but you still need to be spending more time on theorizing, right? It's so true. I remember when I was a postdoc, that's after I finished my PhD, one of the postdocs had a quote on his door, which I don't know where this came from, but it was something to the effect of like, the more time I spend in front of my computer, the dumber I become. <laughs> and it's supposed to be funny in that, you know, we just think the computer can do everything for us and we just code without thinking. Right. So talking about uh, looking for planets out there, we just got to know some news about the James Webb telescope, which should be online soon. And uh, these telescopes do seem to be getting bigger and more expensive. And do they have to get bigger? And, and what else is, is now being used? Okay, well, let's talk about the test mission for a moment. I just mentioned that test actually has small cameras. Each of the lens, each of the aperture for each camera or lens or telescope, if you will, is only 10 centimeters in diameter. So that's pretty small because the goal for tests is to look at bright stars spread all around the sky. And so we don't really want a really big telescope. We need a small telescope. We need to get a wide field and things like that. So TESS is one. In exoplanets, it's good to think about, at least for um, transiting planets, planets that go in front of the stars seen from the telescope, we usually split up finding planets and characterizing planets. So once TESS has found the planets, uh, we actually, um, eventually when they're established to be real planets, people want to follow up their atmospheres and learn something more about the planet. And our workhorse for studying exoplanet atmospheres has been the Hubble Space Telescope. Because space, away from the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere, is really needed to make very precise measurements. So Hubble is one of our main telescopes as well. And then there's a number of ground-based telescopes that people use to try to study exoplanet atmospheres. But there's a second category of planets. Um, they're not transiting the star. They do not, they're not transiting planets that grow in front of the star as seen from our telescopes they have to be specially aligned. The planet and star have to be lined up just so. And most, uh, most planets will not transit their star. So there's a second technique that's quite popular today. We just call it direct imaging. And in direct imaging, the star is the starlight is blocked out by a device inside the telescope, typically called a coronagraph. And the starlight is blocked out so we can see the planet light directly. But the type of planets we can see with that technique, they're not anything like our solar system planet. They have to be planets far from the star that are incredibly self-luminous, that are bright from energy the planet has on the inside. And these are not kind of what we would normally consider like solar system age pl normal planets, but they're out there. And those are studied as well with large ground-based telescopes, including the Gemini South Telescope, which has a special instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager, as well as Europe. The European Southern Observatory has the very large telescope. So Sarah, you just touched on direct imaging. Uh, uh, is it related to star shades, as I find that a really fascinating subject. Uh, it's so futuristic. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about star shades? That's right. So we in exoplanets, like exoplanets, the reason, one of the reasons it is such an incredibly exciting and inspiring field is we're one of the few fields where we are allowed to think big. We think about crazy, crazy ideas that eventually can become reality. And it's just fantastic. And the mission you're referring to, we call it Starshade. And Starshade is a giant, specially shaped screen. It is on the order of 30 meters in diameter. It's huge. And Starshade, uh, would, it has to fold up and then in space, it's not launched yet, but it would deploy. So it has to unfold, unfurl. And it looks like a giant flower, actually. And we can get into the reasons for that in a moment. But Starshade would be formation fly with a telescope such that the Starshade would block out the starlight so we can see the planet directly. And we need to do that if we want to get down to planets like Earth, like an Earth around a sun-like star. But starshade, it's very complicated, actually. And believe it or not, it was conceived of in the 1960s. At that time, it was like written down on paper by Lyman Spitzer, the same person who conceived the Hubble Space Telescope. But we re it was revisited every decade until now. We finally think we know how to build and launch starshade. But this direct imaging that's ongoing today, it's like 
I want to say it's hundreds of thousands to a million times away from what starshade would be capable of. So in exoplanets, we kind of have this long, almost 100-year future ahead of us where we're doing things today on hot giant planets and we're using Hubble and we're using ground-based telescopes, but we foresee like this next generation of telescopes, maybe two generations from now, that will do the job we really want. Right. So, Sarah, before we continue, I just want to get this right, and that is the definition of an exoplanet. So, an exoplanet is any planet that orbits a star other than our sun. And I guess with all the stars that we see in the sky today, it is safe to assume that they have at least one planet uh, revolving around it? Right. So, yes. Exoplanets, believe it or not, there's no official dictionary definition and there's no agreed upon definition. But loosely speaking, yes, exoplanets are planets that orbit stars other than the sun. And just as a caveat, believe it or not, there are some so-called free-floating planets. So we don't have to go there right now, but just to be, just to be complete. There's evidence that nearly every star has planets. We actually do think that every star has more than one planet, has a planetary system, almost every star. And so far we have identified uh, about 4,000 of them? Yeah, there's two lists that we carry with us. One of them is the planets that are confirmed planets that we're all sure are planets. And there's, an, and there's I want to say on the order of four or 5,000 of those. And then there's another list of planets that we call planet candidates, where we haven't verified that they're actually planets. And there's another few thousand. But the numbers are just huge. Like, it's almost less important what is our current tally today, and maybe more important that there are billions of stars out there in our galaxy alone, trillions more, more likely. And since you are looking or hunting for these planets, uh, could you explain a bit more about the transiting process that you use? Yes, yes. Well, transiting planet is a planet that goes in front of the star as seen from Earth or from our telescopes. Now, it has to have a very special alignment because if the planet is orbiting in the plane of the sky, we won't see a transit. But for those that are transiting, when the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight drops by a tiny, tiny amount. And that amount is actually the planet to star area ratio. So that planet disk um, blocks out some light on the star. And the way we find planets today, the most common way to find them that the test space mission does, that Kepler before it did, and that many ground-based telescopes do, is these telescopes monitor a large number of stars, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands to millions of stars. And essentially, we're taking an image of the star field every few seconds or minutes. So we just have a star field image over and over and over again of the exact same set of stars. And we task our computers to measure the brightness of each star. And the computer then is looking for a signal that a star that's just more or less the same brightness in every single image all of a sudden starts to drop in brightness when the planet just happens to go in front of the star. Mm -hmm. And that drop in brightness lasts for on the order of one hour to a few hours. And when the planet finishes transiting, the star goes back to normal. And then the computer is looking for that event to happen more than once because every time the planet goes around the star, a transit will happen. So we're effectively looking at a brightness time series of a star, looking for a tiny drop in brightness that's characteristic of a planet going in front of the star. And that's the first step in planet finding. But uh, would that depend on the ratio of the size of the star? as compared to the size of the planet for for this transiting process. So the bigger the planet uh, and, and uh, the better it would be, or getting the right ratio uh, would be perfect for you. Yeah, the right ratio is perfect. So a giant planet transiting a sun-like star is about a 1% drop in brightness, which actually is not too hard to find. Tests could blow that away. But if we wanted an Earth-sized planet transiting a sun-like star, that signal is more like 1 in 10,000, which is actually even too hard for the test mission. The test sweet spot is actually for a planet 
of almost any size transiting a small red dwarf star, a red dwarf star that is much smaller and cooler than our sun. It also depends on the orbit, so based on Kepler's third law, planets that are farther from the star orbit more slowly. And a more slow orbit means the transit will last longer, but then transit to transit takes longer as well. So, but we have everything. The amazing thing about exoplanets is they actually come in apparently all sizes, all orbits, all masses imaginable. So we can have planets that have the time that between two transits or the period is less than a day. We can see transits up to weeks or even longer. And Sara, at the moment with current data that you have, uh, we would assume that the way planets are formed, you would have uh, more big Jupiter-type planets uh, compared to Earth-sized planets. But uh, that is not the case, right? Right, right. Let's go over that again. That our planet formation concepts were that planets just keep growing until they would exhaust all of the material around them. Like as if a, plan a Jupiter-type planet forming like a cosmic vacuum cleaner that sucks in all the material in its gravitational influence. And lo and behold, what Kepler found was that's not, that giant planets are not nearly as common as smaller planets. And even more puzzling, Kepler found that the most common planet in our galaxy is a planet two to three times the size of Earth, that we have no solar system counterpart. In our solar system, we have Earth, Venus, which are one Earth size by definition. We have Jupiter, which is about 11 times the size of Earth and a few hundred times Earth's mass. We also have Uranus and Neptune, which are four times the size of Earth. The planets in the two to three times earth size range, we actually don't really know how they formed, how they even came to be. And according to Kepler, they're the most common planet out there. But all that said, we're not sure how common Earths really are because it's easier to find these larger, you know, the two to three times size of Earth planet is easier to find than an earth size planet. And uh, using the transiting method, could you then get the size and energy emitted from a planet? Uh, or the mass as well? Yes, we do. We, the transit method gives us the planet size if we know the size of the star. And because we know the period, we can find the orbit, hence how much energy from the star is hitting the planet. So we get those. Getting the planet mass is more in t time intensive. We try to get that as well. Right. And I was just thinking of something while you were talking about the test mission, and that is the, the photography that's involved here. Because... For anyone who's involved in photography uh, would know what I'm talking about when I say that it's really difficult here on Earth uh, when you're in control of a camera with, to get the right focus. You have to get the angle right. You've got to keep adjusting the lens. But uh, with these pictures that you are talking about from probably uh, vibrating spaceships or telescopes that uh, are still moving uh, at distances, and the distance that it has to cover, how do you get that kind of precision with those photographs in spite of all these constraints? That's a great question. And that is really the key question, actually, for you've asked like the heart of the whole entire transit method, actually. It turns out that if you could open your phone up and look at your detector, the detector for the camera, and if you shined an LED or laser at the different pixels, and you measured the response, like how much light comes back to you across one pixel. Did you know that would vary up to about 40%? Yeah. So it's not just the blurriness of, you know, your hands shaking when you take the picture or when our telescope is looking at the star, but that pointing is so important because as the star moves around, it not only gets blurry, but different, you're, you will measure a different effective brightness of the star as the center of the star moves around within a pixel. So do you see what I'm saying? Like we want to measure the star be brightness. It's intrinsic brightness. We want to measure the star's intrinsic brightness. But if the detector properties change within a pixel and somewhat from pixel to pixel, then that's all a mess unless we can keep it on the same pixel at all time. Well, different telescopes use different um, methods. And for tests, it's, you know, it's pretty heavy. So it has some mass inertia. And it also has uh, reaction wheels that keep spinning. So it keeps track of like uh, which stars are where on the detector. And there's feedback mechanisms to 
keep it pointed precisely. As a sort of separate topic, I just want to throw out there as a bit of an aside, is one of my exciting projects was a CubeSat. We called the CubeSat Asteria. CubeSats are really small satellites that fit in a specific form factor. And our whole goal was to, I mean, this CubeSat, it launched in 2017 from the International Space. We were, we launched in 2017 as cargo on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket to the International Space Station. And a few months later, in November 2017, we were deployed and the CubeSat Asteria lasted for a couple of years. It's actually a prototype for what I would envision would be a fleet of telescopes, little miniature telescopes. And each one would stare at one star for as long as possible with the goal of getting down to Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars, around the brightest sun-like stars. They're spread all across the sky. And you can't have one telescope monitor the entire sky at all times. But anyway, long story short, is we had to show how to point a tiny telescope. And that's difficult because the low mass, you know, means it can get pushed around mm -hmm. very easily. And even the reaction wheels on the small satellite, on the CubeSat, they weren't precise enough to point it precisely because they induce some jitter on their own and they just can't control it. So we, in that case, we had almost like, I don't know if anyone has, any of you have heard of image stabling binoculars. They yes. actually correct for you. Yes, we all, we effectively did an image stabilization and it's a little complicated to explain, but we had the reaction wheels, which partially stabilized the small telescope. And then we had a control on the focal plane so where the detector is, it tracked the stars. And as the stars moved away from their fraction of a pixel, the focal plane would, could move back and forth in a control loop. So we monitored the stars as they drifted. The part of the detector would be moving back and forth in um, two dimensions to match, get the stars back on the same fraction of a pixel. Well, that's a great concept. And if you're trying to find the brightest stars, uh, the distance between them would be a lot, I guess, compared to the area you can cover because uh, with these nano satellites, you could cover a lot more area. Right, right. I mean, our goal, I'm sure that you and your audience have heard of the, I mean, there we have mixed feelings about it, the mega constellations being launched by SpaceX and Amazon and other, they're launching tens of thousands of satellites. We're not talking about that, but for my concept, if we could launch a hundred satellites, a uh, hundred little miniature telescopes, it would be totally amazing. Oh, just the thought is stunning. And uh, you have mentioned about identifications of uh, planets as you find them. Now, what about the, when you find these planets, what are the chances? What are the chances that, please finish. Yeah. Okay, so here's the question. What are the chances that we actually find life on one of these planets? I think that's a very interesting question and a lot of us would want to know an answer from you. Yeah, that's a question I get a lot. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because it's not like, we. there's sort of speculation and then there's scientific planning. So I love giving this other an answer. It's just not, to, I will answer your question eventually, but I love to give this answer that, you know, we'll have the capability to find signs of life on another planet with our next generation telescopes. So we can definitely make progress, but whether or not we can truly identify a gas that might be produced by life, that depends what nature has in store for us. You know, there's very few planets that we have access to. We haven't really covered it yet because there are, it's true, there are thousands of planets we know about and there are trillions of planets in our galaxy, surely. But we have, we're still like, we're like babies taking our first crawl, crawling, not even walking. And we really are, you know, we, we are so, we call it photon starved. We, the, we get so few photons from these planets, it's incredibly difficult to study their atmospheres. Like for analogy, think of an onion and the skin of an onion is so small compared to that onion. That's like the atmosphere on a planet. It is so small compared to the planet. And now we're trying to study that atmosphere as the planet is transiting the star, some of the starlight can shine through the atmosphere. And we actually can study the gases in the atmosphere by what is imprinted on the starlight. And what we're looking for are gases in the atmosphere that don't belong, that might be produced by life. 
And so if we had time and a blackboard and we could a chalkboard and we could break down every step, you just see how hard and challenging it is. And we have, you know, we'll have maybe half a dozen planets that we can study with the James Webb Space Telescope and look for signs of life on. But do you think that if you have half a dozen that, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that the six planets that we're hopefully going to have to study that we get telescope time for, what are the chances that they have life on them? That's really what the question is. It's not really, can we detect it? But it's mm -hmm. more that one of those special, precious few planets, are we so lucky that there's life there? I, I think the biosignatures would vary depending on the phase of development of the planet. Example, uh, Earth at its very early years did have life, but did it emit those biosignatures? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, similarly, the, the planets we are finding uh, today could just be in another phase of its evolution. So biosignatures may be detected, but is that directly connected to life or what phase of life? Right, right. It could be in another phase of its evolution. So yeah, there's a lot involved there. But I really do want everyone listening to this podcast to know that this is a multi-generational project. <laughs> so in my generation, we're going to find habitable planets for sure. We have candidates already. We just need to look more closely at them, at their atmospheres, and to understand if their temperatures can support life, if they have water to support life. And now the speculation is I do believe we will find some kind of sign. It might not be a very good sign, but it will be enough to keep the search going to motivate all of you folks and governments and private investors to spend money to make the next generation of telescopes and so on and so on. So we're relying on everyone to participate in the search and for people who are interested to find a way to be involved because whatever I find, it's not going to be enough. It's only going to be enough to motivate all of you in the next generation to keep going. The way we do break it down is that the so-called Goldilocks zone, it's the zone around the star where a planet heated by the star is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. So if we think about Venus, for example, our so-called sister planet that's closer to the sun than we are, Venus is too hot for life. It actually, um, we think it had a water ocean before where water is needed for all life as we know it, but it became so hot that the water oceans evaporated and Venus became like hotter than any desert on earth. In contrast, we have Mars, like a, um, Mars is kind of is small actually. So there's other reasons why it's not habitable, but planets that get too far from the sun, all the water and carbon dioxide would freeze out. And essentially the planet would be too cold for life. So it's really a zone around the star where the planet is receiving energy from the star and it's getting heated to the right temperature for life. And uh, Kepler-452 fitted this bill. Well, every the funny thing is every year or two, there's a new planet people get excited about. Right. And we really don't know if these planets are truly habitable. All we know is that the planet is in the habitable zone. But we do need to get more observations to actually know if the planet is habitable. For example, you know, one crazy thing is that we don't understand why Earth and Venus and exoplanets, we don't understand what sets the atmosphere mass and composition. So some of these planets, we don't know what the atmosphere is. Does it have a massive greenhouse effect that makes it, even though it's in the so-called habitable zone, too hot for life? And there's... Some planets may have hydrogen atmospheres. They may be massive enough to hold on to hydrogen gas. And hydrogen is a potent greenhouse gas. People have studied hydrogen and they think that the habitable zone could extend much further than the so-called traditional habitable zone. So there's a lot of factors to consider. There are a bunch of, let's call them potentially habitable planets because we don't know if they're habitable for sure. And we just need to wait till we can get more information. And would you say that... Uh size of the planet matters because uh, if you're looking for these biosignatures, a smaller planet, I guess, uh, would be able to store or conserve these uh, better than a bigger planet would. That's right. Their size definitely matters. We think for a Jupiter-sized planet, well, we know for a Jupiter-sized planet, there's no solid surface as we know it. And believe it or not, Jupiter, even though it's so far from our sun, 
it's actually very hot. As if you could imagine going to Jupiter and traveling down through the atmosphere, you don't have to go too far for it to get way too hot for life. So there's no surface and there's like um, air currents that are moving material up and down vertically through the atmosphere. So on the giant planets that are big, there's not going to be any life there because they're actually too hot on the inside. We don't, we're not sure exactly the size, but say less than two Earth radii. So are there more gas planets in the universe as compared to uh, rocky mass planets, or are they the same in number? We actually have to, you know, in order to answer that question, we have to figure out what the, those mysterious planets of two to three times the size of Earth, we call them mini Neptunes. We have to figure out what those are first to answer your question. But if those mini Neptunes are, if they have large gas envelopes, then more planets have large gas envelopes than are rocky right now. But I don't have a good answer for that one yet. And Sarah, since you have been observing and studying so many of these exoplanets, could you give us a few exciting or maybe strange examples where life could be different there? Sure, sure. Uh, there's lots of interesting planets out there. They're the planets we talked briefly about already. They're Earth-sized planets that are so close to their star that their orbits, their year, is less than one day. And these planets are heated by the star so much to 1,000, 2,000 degrees Kelvin that the surfaces are hot enough to melt rock. So on these so-called hot super-Earths, they would have liquid lava lakes, not from volcanoes, but from just be the heat from the star itself. So those are pretty crazy worlds. We definitely wouldn't want to visit those. I love these mini Neptunes. One idea about what some of them are made of is that they would be water worlds. They'd be 50% water, by mass, kind of like a scaled up version of one of Jupiter's icy moons. And we've made models of some of these water worlds, and the warm ones anyway. I want you to imagine a thick steam atmosphere, like a sauna, but wow, so thick. And then going down into the planet, we would encounter a layer of superfluid. It's like not quite a gas, not quite a liquid, a state of water that the deep sea hydrothermal vents. And beneath that really weird material, the superfluid water, there'd be a layer of ice, but not ice like your ice cubes. It would be like a layer of really high pressure ice. So that's another really type of exotic world. I want to also talk about Earth. I don't even want to call them Earth-like, but an Earth-sized planet transiting an M dwarf star. Those are the ones that are the kind of planets that would host life that are most accessible, accessible to us today. Just because as we talked about, it's so much easier to find a small planet transiting an M dwarf, a red dwarf star, than it is to find a transiting planet in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. Now, these red dwarf stars, they give off much less energy than our sun. And so a planet in the habitable zone of an M dwarf star would be much closer to that M dwarf star than our Earth is to our sun. And do you know what it means if the planet is close to the M dwarf star? It, like what happens over time by tidal interaction just like on Earth, we have the tides, we see that in our ocean from our tidal interaction with our moon, is that the planet would have a very special configuration. It would be so-called tidally locked. It would rotate one time for every time it orbits, just like our moon does. Our moon always shows the same face to Earth at all times. Mm. Because our Earth, you know, rotates one time for every time it orbits. But what this means on the planet itself, this tidally locked planet, transit orbiting an M dwarf star, you know, it means that the star would be in the same part of the sky at all times. The star or the sun would never set. Wow. So even though that planet is, those types of planets are so-called habitable, yes, the star would be in the same part of the sky all the time. So you would never have a day or night uh, separation? Yep. You'd never have day or night. And so part of that planet is always in night and part of that planet's always in day. And, and you mentioned the planet that revolved around its star every 24 hours. That means a year would be one day. Right. The hot super Earth that, whose orbits are less than one day. Every year is less than 24 hours. So a lot of us are Star Wars fans and we see uh, these planets with two suns. Is that a reality? Or are those planets even really out there? 
that's not so common, but there's on the order of a couple dozen systems actually that, yeah, the star, the planet has two suns. The planet is orbiting two stars. And so those are nice, but we haven't found any rocky planets that do that. Just uh, giant planets so far. So I, I think you can clarify a very interesting fact for us here and something that I've been reading as well. And I don't think there's anyone better who can do that for us today. Is it true that there is a planet that is actually made of diamonds? Is that a fact? That is not a fact. So one thing <laughs> for all of you out there, be when you read the news about any topic, right? It's not just about science. You have to take it with a grain of salt. You have to think about whether or not it's realistic. This diamond issue is, it's partly my responsibility in a way, but my colleague and I a long time ago came up with this idea of carbon planets, planets that would be um, have more carbon compounds than silicon compounds. But anyway, if you look at a phase diagram of carbon, you know what a phase diagram is? It right. shows you temperature and pressure, and then it shows you what phase the material is in. So mm -hmm. people are more familiar with water. So if you look at a phase diagram for water, you can tell what temperature and pressure is water vapor, what temperature is at ice, what temperature is water liquid. Well, other materials go through different phases as well. And if you look at a phase diagram for carbon, pure carbon, like that area for diamond, it's really tiny. It's not, it's very, very tiny, much smaller than the range available for liquid water. So if you have a planet, you know that planet encompasses a wide range of pressure, right? Zero pressure at the surface, immense pressure at the center, and then all variety throughout. So there's no way that the entire planet can be made of diamond, simply because even if you had a planet of pure carbon, which you can't have, but if you had a planet of pure carbon, only a small part of that planet would have the temperature and pressure suitable to make diamond. <laughs> so that's, that's an answer for you. Thank you for that clarification, Sarah. So for everyone listening, no more Diamond Planet posts on Instagram. And I just want to move on to probably one of the more interesting aspects on the hunt for exoplanets, and that is life on other planets. Uh, what is your view on this with the Drake equation and the number of new planets? Uh, now, it takes this Drake equation to another level compared to when it was conceived. Right, right. So my speculative answer, you know what my answer is, because I wake up every day and I work hard on the our chance to find life on another planet. So I believe that there is life out there somewhere. There has to be. The ingredients for life are everywhere. As you said, we're making progress on the Drake equation. We know that rocky planets exist now, and we know they're common. So somewhere there has to be the right combination of a rocky planet in the habitable zone that has liquid water and that has signs of life on it. And when you look at the atmosphere to see if there are life emitting gases, uh, a lot of these gases could be emitted by uh, geological processes. And what if it is silicon based life? Uh, you would not be able to detect it. Uh, do you consider that a problem? We don't consider that a problem. If we think about in astronomy, our tools are spectroscopy, like the ability to measure gases on other worlds. We don't have a way to know what kind of life it is that is creating that gas, whether it's intelligent humanoids, whether it's bacteria like slime, or if it's silicon based or some other kind of life. We actually don't have a way to deconstruct whatever gas we see and sort of work back to what actually is making that gas. So I get a pass on that question because we won't be able to, to know what's out there. In fact, in your, embedded in your question was a really good, good point, too, that a lot of the gases we're looking for, they are also made by geological processes. Like methane, for example, is made by a type of bacteria called methanogens. It's output by cows. Methane is definitely a gas made by biology. But, you know, geology has the same gases to work with that life does. So sometimes life produces a gas, but it can also be made by non-biological means. Methane, for example, is emitted by deep sea volcanic ridges. And so it's a big, big, huge problem, maybe permanent in some cases, to try to establish whether a gas we're going to see is made by life or whether it is a false positive or made by some non-biological sources. So that just compounds our problem with those special 
half dozen planets, if we go out there and find a sign of life, can we be really sure that it's by life? We probably can't be. Very interesting. And in fact, on our a last episode with uh, Ashwin Vasavada from, from NASA, we did talk about this, where they uh, detected uh, methane on, on Mars. That was really, really surprising. Right, right. That was a good example. It's sort of like a precursor for exoplanets in a way. They found methane on Mars, and it was a bit controversial at first because we observed it. The astronomy community saw it with ground-based telescopes here. An orbiter found it. A lander found it. And then the question was, is it by life or is it just some unusual geophysical or geological process? <laughs> so it's a great example. Right. And another very interesting concept that uh, just does not go away is planet X. And we have heard about it. Uh, what is the possibility of this hidden planet actually being out there but not yet detected? What do you think about it? Do you mean um, a planet X in our own solar system? Yes, in our own solar system. Well, there is this planet called Planet Nine. Have you read up about that? Right. I'm talking about the same one. Yes. Oddly enough, so just to review, Planet Nine is, people love to imagine, right, that there is some, I don't know, 10 Earth mass planet out there that swings through once yep. every yep. very long time and wreaks havoc. <laughs> and changes the course of uh, civilization. Yeah, and changes civilization. And I just love Planet Nine because... You know, there are these Pluto-like objects that have strange orbits that seem to imply there's a massive body out in the solar system shaping their orbits. But I want you to know my personal opinion is that the chance for this planet to exist, it's getting lower with time. Because if Planet Nine exists, like the astronomers uh, have figured out how massive it should be and what its characteristics might be, we should be able to see it in the sky. Not you and I with our whatever telescopes or iPhone or phones. But there's big telescopes that survey the, the night sky and that look for distant objects. And so the astronomers went back into the archive data. And if it was easy to find, they would have found it. And if it was harder to find, they would have found it. But this Planet 9, if it's there, it's proving very difficult to find. And I think within a few years, we should know whether it's out there or not. Uh, so, Sarah, now coming to uh, intelligent life. Uh, what are your views on this? We've been talking about uh, primitive life forms that could emit traces through gases. But progressively, if we do find traces of life, then we need to consider every possibility. Because once you find something down the road, you cannot assume that it's not gone ahead. Right, right. We like to believe that evolution wants to go to more and more complex things, including intelligence. But I do like the way you put it, because that's how I view it, that we're just kind of checking the boxes. First, we found exoplanets. Then we found rocky exoplanets. Then we've established rocky planets are common. Our next steps are to show that planets, rocky planets with water are common, that they could support life, and that biosignature gases exist, or biosignature gases appear to be out there, which supports life as well. So we're just trying to get all that done. And then I think we're in more of a position to speculate on intelligent life. But I think, you know, most exoplanet enthusiasts like myself, like you, like, uh, like others, we want to believe in intelligent life is that it's out there somewhere. Oh, yes, I, I agree. There's something about that possibility that just uh, gets us all really interested. And, and, and a lot of popular culture as well seems to reflect that. Uh, we do, however, have a new kind of science fiction that is probably more hard science fiction. Example, movies like uh, The Martian. Uh, you would call that hard science fiction because there's a lot of fact in it. And do you follow these types of movies? And does someone like you actually watch this? Well, I do watch. The funny thing is, usually I only watch movies on the plane, like when I'm traveling. But since there's no travel now because of COVID, I might be a bit behind in my movie watching. But yes, I do love watching all those movies. The Martian, this movie I really liked called Arrival. Um, Arrival, that was the movie when aliens come to Earth and they have these giant pods that are floating in the sky. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. Oh yes, that's a great movie. I think by uh, Denis Velue, they were trying to figure out how to uh, decode the language of the aliens. 
Right, and they came to one to each continent, I think. Mm -hmm. And it, I love that movie because it was the first time they showed that aliens don't have to be little green humanoids, like E.T. <laughs> yeah. um, so, and just we have no idea how to communicate with them or what they would be. I really like that movie. Uh, I watched The Passenger. I don't know if you've seen that one. Imagine traveling to another world. What are we going to do? Are we going to hibernate like they did in Passenger? They hibernated. Or do you think we might be so far advanced that we will send our raw DNA and raw biological materials with instructions on how to print uh, humans or life forms, if you will? Like, we don't know yet how we're going to be getting to another world or what will happen in the future. I also watched, uh, well, Interstellar obviously was a very popular movie. Have you seen right. that one? That was brilliant. What I liked about Interstellar, that's really hits home because we can see planets and learn more and more about them. But even in Interstellar, they had to go to the planet, right? They had to travel to the planet to actually learn if the planet was habitable. That's actually good for, for our conversation because we can mm -hmm. speculate all we want. Our data is so limited, but we really won't know until we have a way to send probes to these other worlds. Yes, but uh, uh, that brings in the problem with the speed that we can travel at. So unless there is a total change to our physics, we are always going to be limited. I don't know how far we will travel, at least in my lifetime. Uh, Voyager is probably the spacecraft that's gone uh, the furthest so far. Right, right. Voyager, the Voyagers are traveling around 20 kilometers per second. Mm. And they would take tens of thousands of years to reach our nearest star system. But you know the great thing about exoplanets is, is we have this... Um, what's considered mainstream science and what is considered completely crazy. The line that divides those is constantly shifting. So if you had interviewed me 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we, it would have been crazy. Like we would have been talking about exoplanets and the search for life and biosignatures and people would have just not listened to this. It would have just been out there. And just like that, this sort of idea of going to another star system it's still on the side of crazy, so don't get me wrong, <laughs> because mm -hmm. it takes so long to get there. But it's actually kind of, it's in this shifting, shifting of what is crazy and what is not. It's moving along. And so I want to draw your attention to a mission called Starshot. And Starshot yeah. is a concept. Yeah, it's a concept. It's not a real thing. But just the fact that people are putting money towards thinking about a way to get to the nearest star system, it's actually just incredible. And what Starshot is, it's a concept that we would launch thousands of tiny space chips, not space ship, but space chip, little mm -hmm. tiny satellites. And each of these thousands of little satellites would deploy a solar sail. And then we would have, it is a bit fantastical, but we would have a giant bank of lasers taking up a square kilometer and operating at like a gigawatt power. And they would uh, shine on these newly deployed solar sails and accelerate them to incredible speeds of like a 20th the speed of light and that would accelerate these um, would accelerate these solar sails so they can travel at 0.2 the speed of light. And if all of this could work, it would still take 20 years for the these solar sails. They wouldn't all make it. Most of them probably wouldn't make it at all. But they would sail by Alpha Centauri, our nearest star system, and they would snap some images and send those images back to Earth. So that whole thing would take 20, 25 years. So imagine if if Money has, um, the Breakthrough Foundation has put $100 million towards solving what are like the 19 technical problems, they're big problems that they, they acknowledge. But what if we could do this 30 years from now, we find a way to launch these little star chip solar sails, and then it takes another 20 years to get to Alpha Centauri, and then five years back. So that is 25 to 25, 50 years. So in 50 years, we could get an image of a, another planetary system. That's fun. That would be technically in your lifetime. Oh, thank you for that. That that's really comforting. But uh, getting to Starshot, it would be traveling at about twenty percent the speed of light. Right, twenty percent the speed of light. Right. Right. Now, if we could push that further to say about forty to fifty percent the speed of light you could also get into wormholes and we get uh, into very interesting areas. Right. It would be amazing. But what my point is not necessarily that this will become reality, 
but it lets our imaginations take hold because someone believes it's possible. And that's sort of the first, like going back 50 years, someone thought it was possible to find exoplanets. Everyone else thought it was crazy. Now there's so many planets, we, we don't even have time to think about all of them carefully. And so I just hope someday that we can go to another star system, whether that's 50 years from now or 500 or even 5,000. I think finance would be uh, critical here because with these projects, if uh, we have the finances, uh, we have the ideas. It's right, actually. And sometimes when we don't have the finances, things just take a very long time. <laughs> so, yeah. Right, Sarah. And uh, we do know that we have to let you go, but I have a couple of questions from uh, our colleagues online. And if you are okay to take those. Sure. So we have a question here from Astronomy Forum who runs his page on Instagram, a great page, I have to say. And his question is, there are a few exoplanets just like Earth. And if one day we could travel to those planets, what would the risk be of actually living there? Because we do not have Jupiter or Saturn to protect us. Okay, let me just, before we I answer the question, say that, first of all, we don't have any Earth-like planets. We know of Earth-sized planets or Earth-mass planets, but so far, we don't have enough information to know if any of these are actually like Earth. Mm. Okay, next question. The question was about Jupiter and Saturn. It's believed that Jupiter protects us because if there's any crazy asteroids or comets out there, they will get funneled into Jupiter, which is much more of a Jupiter, which is really massive gravitationally and will attract all these objects. I think that's an interesting question, but, you know, we do know that Jupiter created our asteroid belt. So if you think of it that way, Jupiter created our asteroid belt and stirs up our asteroid belt, sending asteroids to Earth. So in that sense, Jupiter was bad for us because it actually created these very hazardous objects. So I don't think we need to worry that there's no Jupiter and Saturns in these uh, other planets. Planet, that there might not be a Jupiter or Saturn in the other planetary systems. We have another question here from Ankit Khare from Indore. And the question is, in case we discover another planet with life, one, would it be a good decision to first communicate with them? And second, what would the language of communication be? Everyone definitely wants to know, should we communicate with another planet? And people debate this heavily. Right now, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, SETI, they spend a lot of time listening. They have radio telescope time, uh, time on large radio telescopes, pointing them at other stars, hoping for a signal. But we don't send messages out. So that one's really up to you to, to answer. I think it's fine, personally. I think that... If there are intelligent aliens out there, they'll know we're here regardless of whether we, we send them a direct message. What was the second part of that question again? What would the language of communication be? Well, our language of communication is mostly like binary and math. I think when we're sending signals, it would be like pulses. It's a language really that is just uh, something that is not found in nature. <laughs> That's not a very good answer, but you know, we have to construct like an artificial signal. Right. And I think connected to this, uh, the wow signal comes to mind. That was very interesting, a very interesting moment, at least from uh, what we heard and read about it. Would you uh, want to comment on that? Well, some time ago, SETI found an incredible signal. It was not repeated, though. And they called it the wow signal because someone who noted it in his or her notebook uh, circled it and wrote wow, exclamation mark. It was a giant signal coming from another star. But one thing in this SETI search in the radio data is, generally speaking, people don't save the data. So you, know, you can't go back and reanalyze it again because there's so much data, way too much to store. And they never saw a signal again, so we simply don't know what that was. It's unknown. And Sarah, are you also involved with SETI? And do you collaborate on projects or share data? We do overlap a lot. It really is a kind of separate thing because radio astronomy, it's its own special field, actually. It seems very complex. But with the, the test mission, we do have a collaboration going with Breakthrough SETI. 
in that we help them figure out which target stars they should be looking at because they do have a focused search. So they, they do have a blind survey where they just stare at part of the sky. But SETI also does the targeted search, focusing in on individual star systems. Right. And Sarah, I'm sure after listening to you today, a lot of us would want to uh, continue listening to you, maybe read a few of your papers, get to know a little bit more about your research. And if someone wants to do that, where do they find you? Sure, they can go to my website, which is sarahseeger.com. So it's just my name, um, .com. And they can, uh, there's a lot of information there. They can take it from there. I do also, I'm on Facebook. My kids, I have teenagers. They say Facebook is for old people. So I do have like Instagram and um, Twitter, but I, I'm not as active on those. Oh, yes. Uh, we are very active on Instagram through the Indian Genes page. And we have a great bunch of very engaged followers. So a big shout out to all of them for the support. And Sarah, as we've discussed before, a lot of our listeners are students. And at probably that moment or stage in their careers where they are trying to decide on their future course of action for uh, fields that they want to choose or take. And if somebody is interested in maybe getting out there and, and studying a little bit more, or getting into exoplanets, what would your advice be for them? Okay, so I'll tell you a couple of things you can do. One is, it's a website called Eyes on Exoplanets. Right. So it's Eyes, E-Y-E-S, Eyes on Exoplanets. It's a NASA website. And you download an app. It's very interactive. And it allows you to literally explore what's out there. You can click on stars and see what planets are there. It's a great website. The second one I'll refer you to is called planethunters.org. And in planethunters.org, you can it's a crowdsourcing website where you can actually help find planets. And even though I said initially that computers are searching through all of our data and finding planets, remember that the computers only find what we tell them to look for. And in planethunters.org, the crowdsourcing community has helped find some new planets that the computers missed. Your eye is still the best computer. <laughs> so those are two websites you can use to get started. And you know, in general, if you want to learn more about exoplanets, I definitely recommend learning Python, learning how to computer code, that's really a skill that you'll need for anything you do. But my final piece of advice to everybody out there is ultimately, you know, to be successful, to be happy in life. It's very, very important to find something that you love doing that you're also very good at. And that's what I wish for each of you. So, Sarah, it's been really amazing talking to you. And I'm sure that a lot of people listening to you here in India and, and people who are also listening to this podcast from all over the place would want to know, uh, because we did touch on your book when I uh, came in with your introduction, so they would definitely want to know how they're going to find it, where they find it, and what is it all about? The, sure. book, is, the, book, is about, it, the book is about my life story. It's a memoir, both professional and personal. The book is called The Smallest Lights in the Universe. You can get a copy of the book by just Google the name, and I'm sure it will bring you to a place you can buy the book or download an ebook or even an audiobook. The book is a memoir. It's about my life story, and it interweaves the journey through outer space as well as the journey through inner space. By outer space, of course, I mean the cosmos, all the stars out there, the galaxies, all the exoplanets that we have found and we hope to find yet. The book is also the personal so-called inner space journey. We all have, we're all on our own journey in the search for meaning and hope. Mine centers around a major family tragedy that was just catastrophic for me. It was like when, I mean, it wasn't like this, but the analogy I love to say is it was like when the meteor killed off all the dinosaurs. It was so catastrophic for earth that life and our planet had to be reborn. And the journey talks about my climb out of the abyss, like out of f after falling off a cliff into a deep canyon, how, how I kind of got back out, figuratively speaking, and how I use my work and my search for another earth as a story of hope. It, that's amazing, uh, considering uh, where you are now and what you are doing. But that must have been a really tough journey and I'm sure a lot of us would want to read that and take inspiration from that. Uh, people who are listening to you now, if 
you do want to uh, follow Sara as well. She's just given you these details. I will be linking it in the uh, bio in our description as well as on the podcast. I will be putting links to the book as well as uh, Sara's website. So if you want to hear more about her, I would encourage you to please go there. And thank you once again, Sara. It's been absolutely engrossing and amazing talking to you. We touched on a lot of topics that I was not sure whether we were going to talk about, but uh, I think your patience and the ability to uh, answer all those questions as well. So thank you so much because we spent our time really well. I just hope that uh, you spent your time well with us as well, Sara. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. I wish you and all the listeners clear skies. That's the astronomer saying for, I wish you all the best of luck. Great. Yes. Clear skies to all of us. And thank you very much, Sarah, for being with us. Thanks again.